Good evening. So last week we began to study the book of Galatians. We went through the first chapter. In the first chapter of Galatians, we found out some information. We found out a little about um, Paul, why he's the one writing this, a little bit of his testimony, a little about who he is. Uh, we also found out that there was a problem in Galatia uh, that was significant enough that they contacted Paul so that he would uh, try to help them out with this. Paul was the shaliach or the apostle to uh, Galatia, and so they, when the problem was big enough, they reached out for help. It's the same thing we do uh, congregationally. There's congregations that um, I am on the uh, boards of, uh, Rabbi Wayne's congregation, Congregation uh, Beth Adonai in uh, Atlanta, Congregation uh, uh, Shalom Rome, in, uh, or Tree of Life Fellowship in Rome, Georgia. And so when they have a problem, they'll call me up and they'll say, help, and then I'll laugh where they can't hear me, and then I'll ask them what's wrong, and we'll try to work out what the problem is. So that's kind of what Paul is dealing with. There's a problem. But when we read through the first chapter, we still didn't know what the problem was. We just knew there was a problem. We knew that the problem had something to do with somebody preaching a gospel other than the good news that they were shared with. And so Paul is uh, trying to help them. So now Paul has uh, gone to Arabia. Then he went back to Damascus. And now 14 years go on in between chapter 1 and in the story and chapter 2 in the story. So this is not 14 years traveling in the time of the letter, but Paul is sharing his testimony. And in between chapter 1 and chapter 2, we have 14 more years go by. So this is about 17 years after Paul becomes a believer that he's dealing with what's going on here. So we talked about last week that in order to understand any book of the Bible, no matter where it is, you have to understand the context. You have to understand the context of the culture, the time, the history, all those things. The context of the scripture itself, the context of the chapter and the book. We can't just pick and choose verses. I, 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 a lot of people do. If we could actually just pick and choose verses, then my verse would be, wine makes the heart happy. If you could just take a verse out of the Bible and you could say, I'm just going to build a doctrine off of a single verse without any support, wine makes the heart happy would be my verse. But that's not a single verse that you can do that with. And there's lots of verses in the Bible that tell us not to be drunk in and other things. So you can't just pull a verse out. You have to keep it in the context that it's written, the context of uh, who it's written to. And we talked about last week that in the book of Galatians, as well as most of the books of the Brit Kadashah, when you're reading it, it's either written to Jewish people who do not yet believe in Yeshua, Jewish people who do believe in Yeshua, Gentiles who do not yet believe in Yeshua, and Gentiles that do believe in Yeshua. And you have to determine which one of those is talking to, because if you're talking to Jewish people that know about the law, you're going to teach from one direction. If you talk to Gentiles that don't know anything about the law, you're going to teach an entirely different direction. When I teach at our congregation here, there's a general assumption that most of the people in the room have some understanding of Messianic Judaism, some understanding of the terms we use, some understanding of our, our belief system, all those kind of things. So I don't have to explain all of those things every time I get up. Where when I go to a church to teach, I have to explain a lot more just to get to the beginning of certain things. So 14 years have gone by. And it says, uh, then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus with me. It goes on, because of a revelation, I went up and presented to them the good news that I proclaimed among the Gentiles. But I did so privately to those who seemed to be influential to make sure I would not run or had not run in vain. One of the things we learn about Paul through this text is that Paul is a, uh, a team player. He, he's kingdom-minded. It's not about Paul. It's not about his getting accolades. It's not about him getting attention. It's not about any of those things. And so when he goes to Jerusalem to talk to the people there, the leadership there, 
he, he's got this situation and he goes to them and he talks to them privately. It, it's important for us to understand there are times that we have to talk privately to people about different things. And he said, I did this to those who seemed influential. Why do you go to influential people and talk privately to them? Because you don't want to diminish them in the eyes of whoever uh, is looking up to them. If they're influential, that means they have influence over other people. And so we go to those people. Paul went to those people privately. Um, so we, we know the answer. And we talked about having the answers to when, where, why, and what. So we know um, that this when is 17 years after Paul accepted Messiah. We know the, uh, another why, which is he's traveled to Jerusalem in order to communicate with the apostles. We know another what. Paul tells us that he communicated with the, to the leaders in Jerusalem uh, the gospel that he was preaching to the Gentiles. We know another who. Now we have Barnabas and Titus who's traveling with Paul. We also continue to learn of the ethics of Paul as he chooses to speak privately with the leadership for two reasons. One, so that he wouldn't have uh, be running in vain. And two, so that he wouldn't have run in vain. You know, there's times that we do things because we want it to be successful as we're going along. And there's times we do things because we don't want to ruin that which we've already planted. Those things that we've already done. So we have to be careful. So Paul does this. He doesn't want what he's done in vain or to have run in vain. Uh, so it, and also it seems that Paul is guarded against self-pride and, and me-ism. You know, it's all about me. The scripture goes on. It says, uh, yet not even Titus who was with me, a Greek, was forced to be circumcised. Now the issue came up because of false brothers secretly brought in who slipped in to spy out our freedom and Messiah in order to bring us into bondage. Now there's a couple of things in here that we, we need to look at. Uh, one is the, the verse starts to shed light. These verses start to shed light on uh, and begin to provide an answer to the question of what's being taught that perverts the gospel. If you skim past this verse, you'll miss the foundational statement that'll leave you with a puzzle piece missing and a gaping hole in our understanding of Paul's letter. There's a rule of Bible studies called the first usage, rule of first usage. Anytime a word is used, in the writing of a book of scripture, you can look back to see how the word was used and base its usage on all other places follow in the following text. In the book of Galatians, we've just been introduced to three, I'm sorry, verses three and four to two words and their usage. The first words is liberty and the next word is bondage. Keep in mind the context of these two words and their usage in the verses whenever they come, come we come to them again. In verse 3, we're introduced to a subject that begins to reveal the bottom line of the problem in Galatia. When Paul brings up the fact that while he and his team were in Jerusalem, nobody in leadership there compelled even Titus, who was not Jewish but was a believer in the Jewish Messiah to be circumcised. There were, however, those that were concerned enough about knowing uh, whether Titus was circumcised that they brought in spies to watch Paul and those traveling them bathe so they could find out. You have to remember that in those days they had bathhouses and people would just go into the bathhouse. So they were, this was an important enough issue for them to send spies in to find out if Paul and Titus and the others had been circumcised. It goes on to say, Paul tells us the reason they did this was so that they might bring us into bondage. As students of the word of God, we understand that the words used in scripture to convey a message to us were carefully chosen by the Ruach HaKodesh. And were not just arbitrary words used at a convenience. Paul in this verse uses the plural word us rather than the single word he when describing being brought into bondage. As we're learning to ask questions in our study, let's look at them in this verse. Why us instead of he? How would Titus being circumcised bring Paul into bondage? After all, Paul had Brit Milah, traditional covenant, eighth-day circumcision when he was a child. If it were the act of circumcision that would bring bondage, this wording and thought by Paul would not make any sense. So we must start looking in the letter for the why. So Paul uses the plural words here. He says us and uh, to bring us into bondage. It doesn't say to bring him into bondage. So if it's an us, it's a group thing and not an individual thing. So it can't be the circumcision being talked of because only Titus would have been the one that was being circumcised. Paul had already been circumcised. So there's no way that the bondage that would, they would bring us into, the plurality of the bondage, 
has to do with circumcision alone because that wouldn't make sense in the context of what's being said. Does that make sense, everyone? Okay. The question as well as the what's of the word liberty and bondage, uh, what's being expressed by the words and bond, uh, liberty and bondage in the context of the letter. Another question we need to find out for, uh, find an answer for is why Paul is suddenly talking about circumcision. Was this a new topic or is Paul continuing on the topic at hand? Paul began the letter with a firm and stern rebuke against teaching or preaching a perverted gospel. Did Paul lose track of his thought and turn off the main road on a rabbit trail? Careful study of context of the entire letter will show that this is not a rabbit trail, but rather the traditional theology and traditional interpretation of this book instead has left the main road and began to follow a rabbit trail, never again to return to the road and thereby never understanding the message Paul is trying carefully to transmit through his words. So Paul is now talking about circumcision. Before he was, you know, first chapter, he was talking about this false gospel that was being pretended that was a perverted gospel. And now he's talking about circumcision of Titus or actually not being required to be circumcised of Titus. And often when people get to the part about circumcision, that's their main point. And they'll say circumcision, it's talking about the law, it's talking about obeying that and working your way to salvation and all those kind of things. But that's not where Paul is going, and we'll see that as we go along. We've learned up to this point that there's a problem of false teaching at the congregations in Galatia. We know that this teaching was so strong that believers were being led away from the very gospel they were delivered. We know that they turned to Paul for help and that the help he gave them is in this letter. It's only in verse 3 of the chapter that Paul starts to reveal the nature of the false teaching. It was this false teaching, uh, I'm sorry, it was, it was this false teacher's teaching, this false teaching, that he was trying to, that was trying to remove the liberty that they had in Messiah and place people under bondage. From the content and the context of these verses, we know it has something to do with circumcision. If we follow the reasoning that Paul was not scatterbrained, but really was following the same thought throughout the letter, we will continue to understand. Verse 5. But we did not give in to them for even a moment, so that the truth of the good news might be preserved for you. After Paul tells of this plot to find out if Titus had been circumcised, it would appear that some had challenged Paul concerning the fact that Titus wasn't. Paul responds that they didn't give place, or they didn't allow these people to condemn Titus, or anyone else, not even for an hour. The reason Paul gives for not allowing this to go on is something we need to understand and again keep in context. Paul said he did not allow it so that the truth of the gospel might continue, which returns us to the reason for Paul's letter and the importance of protection of the truth of the gospel. Paul desired to keep the gospel from being perverted or to keep the truth of the gospel. Verse 6. But from those who seem to be influential, whatever they were, makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Well, those influential ones added nothing to my message. On the contrary, they saw that I had been entrusted with the good news for the uncircumcised, just as Peter was for the circumcised. For the same God who was at work in Peter as an emissary to the Jews also was at work in me as an emissary to the Gentiles. Realizing the favor that, I've been give, that had been given to me, Jacob, Peter, and John, who are the recognized pillars, shook hands in partnership with Barnabas and me so that we would go to the Gentiles and they to the Jews. This is one of the most misunderstood sections of the book of Galatians. Again, the only way to understand these verses is to ask questions while keeping them in the context that they were written. In verse 6, Paul is basically just letting the readers know that God doesn't accept anyone just because of who they are or the position they hold. These verses agree with what Peter says in Cornelius' household in Acts 10, 34 through 35. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, I truly understand that God is not one to show favoritism, but in every nation the one who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. Keeping in mind no teaching should be accepted if it doesn't hold true in the light of the entire scripture, no matter who said it. If it doesn't keep in line with the scripture, it's false teaching and should be thrown away. So when we look at the scriptures, if they do not seem to agree with previous scriptures, there's only two choices. The first one we do not, is that we do not fully understand what we've read, 
And the second one is we're reading it out of context and subject. It's only two choices. If you're reading the scripture and it doesn't seem to agree with other scripture, then either you're not understanding what it's saying or you're reading it in the wrong context or the wrong subject. You're applying it the wrong way. In verse 6, Paul ends up by saying uh, what they said, they didn't add, didn't add anything to him. And in verse 7, he continued with the statement, but rather than them enlightening him, it worked out the other way around. They had been enlightened from him by him because they realized that Paul had been appointed, ordained, and made the apostle to the Gentiles or the nation, just as Peter had been made apostle to those circumcised in Israel. The proof of Paul's calling was seen in the results of his ministry. They saw that God was working through Paul just as he was working through Peter. Now let's look back at verse 7. Because from this verse, there have been many bad teachings and false presumptions. If you read the verse out of context, it appears that there are two separate Gospels. One Gospel that Paul shared to the Gentiles and a second Gospel that Peter shared with the Jews. Thus allowing different standards of redemption and responsibility and a placing the wall of separation between the Jewish believer and the non-Jewish believer. And I don't know how many times I've heard people talk that there was a Gospel and a message for the Jews and a gospel to message for the Gentiles. And if you're a Gentile, all that stuff to the Jews is irrelevant. As a matter of fact, I've heard a pastor from in, in town on the radio saying that Gentile believers don't have to worry about anything before the book of Acts is over. That everything after the book of Acts was written to the Gentiles, and you guys should pay attention to them, but everything from the book of Acts back to the beginning of the Bible was written just for the Jews. That there's a gospel message for the Jew and a gospel message for the Gentile. Modern day preachers, there's a teaching called dual covenant theology that teaches that Jewish people can be saved simply by obeying the Torah and being in covenant with Abraham. But Gentiles, they need Yeshua. And a very popular TV preacher preaches that message and promotes that message. But there is only one gospel. From this misapplied, misunder I'm sorry, misapplied understanding of the text, people then justify preaching such things. Jews have to obey the laws of God, but Gentiles are under a different gospel and are not obligated. But all, not only not obligated, but also should not obey the commandments. Matter of fact, we have a modern preacher who's now teaching that Gentiles should be should, the church should unhitch themselves and should not even worry about keeping any of the commandments or anything to do with that. It also brings about replacement theology because Gentile church is giving a new and different gospel. This also makes way for a type of dispensational theology that says God had different plans of salvation for different periods of time. All these false teachings use this verse as a foundation. I know I'm on video, but somebody just pulled in with a truck and a trailer, and Sam, if you don't mind finding out what they're about. However, when you look at the verse in context, both within the section of the letter and as part of the entire letter, you'll see that this view cannot and does not make sense. Looking back at the chapter, we find Paul saying, Though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel than that which you've received, let him be accursed. We can also look at Romans 1.16, where we find the same writer, Paul, speaking so powerfully. He said, For I am not ashamed of the good news, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who trusts, to the Jew first, and also the Greek. If this verse is true, then there is and can only be one gospel and one singular and that singular gospel is a way of salvation and redemption to all mankind both for Jew and Gentile alike therefore keeping in mind that there's only one gospel for all to obey follow and believe and Paul cannot be saying he was given a different gospel or that he'd been trusted with a new or different gospel to preach to the Gentiles but rather that God has called him to deliver the same exact gospel with the same exact salvation and the same exact obligations to, the, uh, to that gospel to the Gentile nations. Now when I say obligations, I'm talking obligations for redemption. 
obligation, how to be saved, how to be redeemed. In verse 9, we find the leadership doing exactly what they should do after seeing the results of Paul's service to God and perceiving the grace given to Paul. They extend the right hand of fellowship to him. As Jacob, Peter, and John, knowing that God had already ordained Paul's position as an apostle, they also recognize his position as an apostle. Galatians 2.10. They asked only that we remember the poor, something I also was eager to do. This short verse seems so simple on the surface and offers some uh, uh, <coughs> to us as well as uh, it offers good information. Here we have Paul joining together officially with the other apostles of Messiah Yeshua, sharing his vision and telling them about all the works God had been doing in his ministry among the nations. This conversation takes place after all the discussions concerning ministry and after the discussion that arose concerning Titus' circumcision, or rather lack of circumcision. When all is said and done, the only requirement that's asked of Paul was that he would remember the needs of the poor. They didn't command or demand for him to change what he was preaching. They didn't ask him to go anywhere different. And most importantly, they didn't ask Paul to change his stand on circumcision or his stand on obedience or observance of the Torah. The only thing they did tell him was to remember the poor. This leads us to conclude one of three things. First, that the apostles just didn't care what Paul was teaching. The second, the apostles believed in two different gospels. Or the third, which is the accurate one, that Paul taught the exact same message of good news as the rest of the apostles. We know from the previous paragraph that there is only one gospel, and we know from other writings of the apostles and Messiah's words that there can be no compromise of truth when it comes to salvation. There was and is only one way. So that leaves only one conclusion possible, which is that Paul preached the exact same message as Peter and just preached it to a different group of people. Galatians 2, 11. But when Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he was clearly in the wrong. For before certain people came from Jacob, he regularly ate with the Gentiles. But when they came, he began to withdraw and separate himself, fearing those of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews joined him in a hypocrisy, so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. It is time once again that we ask some question. What's going on? Why is it going on? Where is it happening? When is it happening? Who is it happening to? Without asking these questions, we as believers have to fall back to the traditional bad interpretation of these verses. The answer to these questions will bring light to the meaning of the verses and allow us to build upon the text that comes before the passage and allows us to build a sure foundation for the following verses. What's going on in verse 11? Peter has traveled to visit the community in Antioch. While he's visiting and spending time with Gentile believers, he's living in unity with them as God had revealed to him in the vision we find in the book of Acts chapter 10. To fully understand what's taking place in Antioch, in the, in, uh, I'm sorry, in Antioch, I'm sorry. To fully understand what is taking place in Antioch in the book of Galatians chapter 2, we must start in Acts chapter 10, 28. We must remember that because of biblical cleanliness laws, it was unlawful for Jews to associate with Gentiles. So it wasn't that Gentiles were subhuman beings. It wasn't any of those kind of things. It wasn't that God thought Gentiles were less important or less evolved or any of those things. It had to do with cleanliness laws and uh, ceremonial cleanliness rituals, ritual cleanliness. Acts 10, 28 says this. He said to them, you yourselves know that it is not permitted for a Jewish man to associate with a non-Jew or to visit him. Yet God has shown me that I should call no one unclean or unholy. So that was Paul, when Peter went to Cornelius' household and he had the vision, the answer to the vision was that God has shown me to, that I should call no man unholy or unclean. The requirement for separation is the understanding of the vision Peter had at the start of, of chapter 10 of Acts. When he sees the sheet coming down from heaven, but after the revelation of the vision becomes clear to Peter, he knows that God, through their faith in Messiah Yeshua, could make Gentiles clean 
or holy. So Peter is living his life according to the revelation of God through Yeshua has made the Gentiles clean until Jacob sent some Jewish believers from Jerusalem to visit Antioch. And then Peter falls back on his old behavior out of fear of what the Jewish believers would think. It is easy to understand how Peter would be concerned that these Jewish believers might not understand because they may not have received the revelation yet of the salvation and cleansing of the Gentiles. Peter would have been concerned that these Jewish believers sent by Jacob could think that Peter had fallen into sin and was failing to keep the commandments concerning purity and holiness by separation. There are also some things that are conspicuously absent from this verse. There is no mention at all about what kind of foods they were eating. This omission of, uh, of any mention of what they were eating leaves us with two options. One, jump to the conclusion that Peter or the Gentiles, and maybe both, were eating unkosher foods. There's absolutely no reason to jump to that conclusion. Number two, we should just read what the verse says written and not add anything to the scripture concerning what they were eating. All it says is he was eating with the Gentiles. It doesn't say what they were eating. It doesn't say they were having shrimp and pork. We'd have to insert something into the text to make it say that. It just says that a group of believers were eating and fellowshipping together. We must be extremely careful not to add to the scriptures to come up with an understanding that is convenient to our doctrine, but rather read what's written and let them base and then base our doctrine upon the words we see. Proverbs 36 says, 30 and 6 says, Do not add to his word, or else he will rebuke you and prove you a liar. When we add to God's word, he will rebuke us and prove us to be liars. So we can see from the scriptures that it would have been easy enough of a reason that these men Peter was eating with were, uh, with were Gentiles to cause separation just because they were Gentiles. When we remember the Jewish people considered Gentiles pagan and were not to even be associated with them. Because by doing so, they would become ritually clean themselves. So we don't have to add anything to the scripture. The scripture said it was against Jewish teaching to fellowship with the Gentiles. He was doing that even though they were believers and even though it was right. But these Jewish believers came from Jerusalem and he pulled back from that and only because they were Gentiles. It doesn't say anything about food or any other commandments. The next thing we notice missing is that Paul doesn't mention anything about Peter not eating with the Gentiles in verse 12. Rather, he speaks of Peter and the other Jews withdrawing and separating themselves, that even Barnabas is carried away with their hypocrisy. So the complaint is before certain people, he ate regularly, but when they came, he began to withdraw himself and separate himself, fearing from those uh, uh, from those, uh, those from the circumcision. The hypocrisy was the separation, not what they were eating or doing. They weren't supposed to separate. Hypocrisy, which was charged that Paul calls Peter onto the carpet for. Peter was acting one way for the Gentile believers and then behaved another way when Jewish believers arrived. Peter was living as if the Gentiles were what the scriptures tell us they are. Uh, Peter was living as if the Gentiles were what the scriptures say they are, grafted in and made clean, but there were no other Jews around. And then once other Jews believers showed up, he started treating them as if they were ritually unclean. That's hypocrisy. Galatians 2.14 But when I saw they were not walking in line with the truth of the good news, again, doesn't have anything to do with the food, it's the truth of the good news, I said to Peter in front of everybody, if you being a Jew live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? Paul begins with four words that seem to be overlooked in discussing what's being said here. And it's vital to our understanding of the text that we slow down and look at these words. The words are, when I saw, tells us the context of the whole chastisement of Peter. Paul visually saw Peter doing something that offended him as a believer and follower of Messiah. The offense was so great and so important, Paul felt it had, he had to deal with it speedily and openly. 
It was such a grave issue that Paul wanted to stop it suddenly and in no uncertain terms. Peter, who should have known better, chose to let man's thinking influence his obedience to God's word. We have to remember, earlier when Paul went to Jerusalem, he went privately so he didn't stir up things or cause any issues. This issue with Peter was so important that he publicly rebuked him. Not only uh, to God's word, but also to the vision that God had shown Peter. To understand the context, we need to return to our question. What was it that affected Peter so, uh, Paul so greatly he felt he needed to change how he was acting? Uh, Peter so greatly he felt he had to change what, how he was acting and revert to separatist Jews' attitude from the past. In order to understand this question, we must first answer a few questions. First, what in the eyes of the Jews at the time of the writing of this letter made them Jews? It was their observant, was it their observance of God's word? Eh, somewhat. How about the land they lived in? These Jews were living outside of Israel. But if we read the discussion the Jewish people had with Yeshua, we find over and over that the central point of their national heritage was that they were children of Abraham or Abraham's seed. The way they noted or identified with this genealogy was through the physical act of circumcision. We find this as a theme throughout the book or letter, and it was only a few verses back in verse 4 that we read of the spies sneaking in to check if the men with Paul had been circumcised. The determining factor of whether or not you could eat or fellowship with somebody was if you were a Jew who was circumcised. In verse 14, Paul is not condemning or accusing Peter of breaking the laws of kashrut, dietary laws, by saying he was living like a Gentile. Not at all. He was referring to his hypocrisy. Because Peter had openly fellowshiped in Eden with Gentiles, and then when some Jews from out of town showed up, instead of standing up for the truth of God's redemptive work in the life of the Gentiles, he reverted outwardly back to believing that you needed to be circumcised and live as a Jew separately from Gentiles. It was Peter's hypocrisy that Paul referred to as living like the Gentiles. In other words, if Peter wanted to preach the necessity of Gentiles giving up their pagan ways and living as believers in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob uh, through faith in Yeshua, then Peter had to also. In other words, if Peter believed that God was redeeming the Gentiles, then he had to act as if he actually believed God had redeemed these Gentiles. You can't say that he is and then act as if you really don't believe it by separating yourselves from them. And so that's what's going on. So Peter speaks, uh, Paul speaks to Peter and lets him know that if he really believed that God had told him not to call any man unclean, that he needed to live consistent with that non-hypocritical and non-hypocritical with that truth, not separating into two groups when God had removed the middle wall of separation through Messiah Yeshua. Verse 15. We're Jews by birth and not sinners from among the Gentiles, yet we know that a person is set right not by deeds based on Torah, but rather through putting trust in Messiah Yeshua. So even we have put our trust in Messiah Yeshua in order that we might be set right based on trusting, trust in Messiah and not by the deeds based on Torah. Because no human will be justified by deeds based on Torah. Paul then continues to speak to Peter, saying that Jews who were made Jews by nature or in fleshly circumcision and are not sinners of the Gentiles or nations or heathens, know that man is not justified by the works of Torah. Now, this is so important because Paul's saying, even back then, that the Jews understood that nobody was justified by the works of Torah. This wasn't a modern-day thing that the church says the Jews had to work their way to salvation and they were justified by observing the Torah. And the Gentiles have grace. But Paul said the Jews even knew that they were not justified by works of the Torah. But we are justified by faith in Messiah. Paul is basing his position on the truth of the gospel, that if Messiah had not died and been resurrected, no one would be or could be justified. Reminding Peter that their redemption is only because we have put our trust in Messiah Yeshua, pointing out that even though both he and Peter 
were born into Jewish households, it was their faith in Messiah and not their circumcision that brought them justification. Paul finishes with the powerful words stating, no human will be justified by deeds of the Torah. Keeping in mind the context, we must also see that Paul does not in any way condemn the keeping of the law in any of his statements, nor does he suggest that Jewish boys should not, be, not have brit malah or circumcision on the eighth day. But rather he signs a light on the truth that if it were possible for a Jewish man to keep every Torah commandment perfectly, he would still not be justified by the Torah apart from faith in the Messiah. Verse 17, but if, while seeking to be justified in Messiah, we ourselves are found to be sinners, is Messiah then an agent of sin? May it never be. This verse is written simply to keep balance in the text and to keep people from running off to the false conclusion that faith in Messiah separates mankind from the responsibility to keep the commandments. This verse is written in a slightly different form in Romans 6, 1 through 2. What shall we say? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? May it never be. How can we who die to sin still live in it? In Romans 6, 15 through 18, What then shall we sin because we're not under the law but under grace? May it never be. Do you not know that to whatever you yield yourselves as slaves for obedience, you are slaves to what you obey, whether it is sin resulting in death or to obedience resulting in righteousness? But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you wholeheartedly obeyed the form of teaching under which you were placed. And after you were set free from sin, you became enslaved to righteousness. Paul is reminding all those reading this book that we cannot separate our faith from our service. And that our faith is largely demonstrated by our lifestyle. Paul knew that this, this is vital that we understand that while it is true that we cannot be justified by the works of the Torah, it is also true that Messiah is not a minister of sin. And if we're his, we must show our love for him by walking in the justification he provided. Or as Yeshua said in the book of John, 14, 15, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And 1 John tells us that sin is the transgression of the law. So if we're to not walk in sin anymore, then Paul is not teaching us in Galatians that the law is over with and that we don't have to keep the law at all or that the commandments are irrelevant to our lives as believers. Galatians 2.18 For if I rebuild the very things I tall down, I prove myself to be a lawbreaker. Paul continues with this verse. To encourage followers of Messiah to not return to the sins of their past. Which in this case include the understanding that God can only justify those who have been physically made Jews by circumcision. Again, don't rebuild the, the old ways. It's not saying that God's ways, his righteousness, his Torah is only for the Jews. After all, one of the things that we destroy by accepting Messiah's justification is the, is the truth that God has, through Messiah, removed the middle wall of partitions. Ephesians 2, 14, For he is our shalom, the one who made two into one and broke down the middle wall of separation. Within his flesh he made powers, powerless the hostility. We become hypocrites like Peter was in Antioch any time and in any way that we rebuild those things in our lives that have been torn down by our faith in Messiah. We must guard ourselves to not return to the things we were once servants to, but have now been delivered from. And we are and will always be servants. The choice is up to us who we are going to serve. Paul wrote in Romans 6.16, Do you not know that whatever you yield yourselves as slaves to obey, you are slaves to what you obey, whether to sin resulting in death or obedience resulting in righteousness? Righteousness requires obedience. Obedience to what? Obedience to the word of God. Also, it's vital to our understanding of verse 18 that Paul's concern about not rebuilding the things which he tore down was that he would, by doing so, it would make him a lawbreaker. 
Clearly, it isn't Paul's intention to lead people away from being law keepers if he's concerned about becoming a law breaker himself. Galatians 2.19 For through law I died to law so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Messiah, and it is no longer I who live, but Messiah lives in me. And the life I now live in the body, I live by trusting in Ben Elohim, the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through Torah, then Messiah died for no reason. Paul, in these verses, does an excellent job sharing a powerful truth. The problem is the understanding of these verses has often been corrupted by traditional theology and man's ever-changing understanding of it. It is through the law that Messiah came. He was born of a woman made under the law. He fulfilled the law perfectly. He was the Word, the Torah that became flesh and dwelt among us. It is through Messiah's fulfillment of the law that we can find our hope of justification. Through the gospel of Messiah's death, burial, and resurrection, we can, live, we can, through the law, die to the law. The Torah was given as a plumb line for righteousness. When we accept Messiah, we are called to live above sin. Because we live above sin, we are dead to the law, and instead we live to God. Another way to say this is that we do not live according to God's word in order to keep the law, but rather we live according to God's word because we love God. We live for God not for law. Paul then goes on to tell us that because he had died with Messiah, Messiah lives in him, and that he now lives in his uh, and that now he lives in his flesh the life of Messiah. By faith in Messiah the son of God who loved him enough to die for him. If Messiah loved us enough to die for us, that we sh should we not love him enough to die in our flesh and live as part of his body? In verse 21, Paul wraps up this thought by saying he does not frustrate the grace of God. Knowing that Messiah died, that we might have righteousness through faith in him. However, most people seem to think frustrating the grace of God somehow equates to keeping the commandments of God. Rather than the proper reading of the words in context, which tells us we should not frustrate the grace of God by believing that keeping the commandments is our way to justification. At, any, at the same time, we need to live our lives without rebuilding things contrary to the law, which we destroy when we walk in faith. It's very important for all believers in Messiah to learn the balance between having faith in what Messiah has done for us by his atoning death and the expectation God has for those who are new creations. Before going on to chapter 3, a question presents itself in these verses that's often left unasked. What was Peter doing in Antioch? After all, Peter, it's taught, was an apostle to the Jews or to the land of Israel. And neither of the two biblical locations for Antioch were inside Israel. Why was he there at all? What's he doing with these Gentiles? The answer to this question is that although Peter was given a calling to the Jews, he was not limited by that calling to exclusively preach to Jews. Just as Paul was called to the Gentile nations, but when, he followed, when we follow his life and ministry, we find everywhere he preached to the Jews at synagogues and to the Gentiles who joined with the Jews. So Peter's ministry was both to both Jew and Gentile, just as Paul's was. Believers are called to share the good news of Yeshua's atonement with the entire world. A person's calling might be that he's a youth leader, should that calling stop him from sharing the plan of deliverance from sin with a senior citizen? Likewise, someone may be a leader of a ladies group. Would this calling limit her responsibility to share the gospel with a man? Of course, the answer is a resounding no to both of these. In the same way, God's calling to Peter and Paul were not exclusive from the general calling to all believers. And that's where we're going to end for tonight. Any questions? <laughs>